Good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Process Studies seminar. I'm John Quiring, the program director. Welcome to Kresge Chapel for our seminar with Dr. Roland Faber. Uh, because of the awkwardness of the space, I don't think I'll ask you to introduce yourselves. We'll just get into the presentation. Um, the paper will be about an hour, so it will we'll run up till 5.05 or 5.10, and then we'll take refreshment breaks out on the patio, and then we'll come back here for questions and answers until 6. Dr. Roland Faber is professor of process theology here at the S School of Theology at Claremont, professor of religion at Claremont Graduate University. He's on extended sabbatical from the University of Vienna, where he is assistant professor of systematic theology and vice chair of the Institute of Dogmatic Theology. He's also here uh, a new co-director of the Center for Process Studies. Dr. Faber has published four books, all in German, the most recent in English translation, uh, the title in Engr English translation is God as Poet of the World. Also, he has published Liberty, Theology, and the Teaching Profession, a book with the subtitle Foundation of a Theology of Suffering and Process Theology, which won the Cardinal Innitzer Prize for Excellence. He has also published numerous journal articles, encyclopedia entries, and chapters to edited books. In addition, to the doctrine of God and creation, Christology, eschatology, and process theology, Dr. Faber's research interests include post-structuralism, interfaith dialogue, comparative philosophy of religion, Renaissance spirituality, mysticism, science and religion, and a third way critique of dualism and theopolitical power. I don't have your title with me right here. Oh. The title for today's lecture is Process Theology as Theopoetics. Will you welcome Dr. Roland Faber? Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the problem with the mic is it's never at the space where it should be, so at my mouth, right? So uh, be patient. My voice is not loud enough and the mic is not at the right place. So it might happen that I have to adjust all the time. The question of my assignment for this lecture was what is process theology? Frankly, however, after all the years investigating in being influenced by and changed through process thought, I still wonder what process theology is. In my last book, God is the Poet of the World, published in German, unfortunately, in 2003 and 2004, I began my immersion into process cosmos with this question. What came to my mind, however, was not a definition, but rather a tentative network of associations that gathered around the three basic suggestions as to a probable description of the field of process theology. I added an open space with probable answers to this question that I ask experts around the world. As you can imagine, none of the answers agreed. These voices indeed revealed process theology not to be a clear-cut method or a subject, but rather to describe a certain region. One moves into an undefined land in which one experiences differently, begins to think differently, and is encouraged to create new theological language. Today, I think that this field or region is an uncontrollable undertaking in the infinite adventure of God's talk, and consciously so, in modes that I came to name Theopoetics. One of the three suggestions in the Poet of the World book indeed was a Theopoetic one. But before I turn to its discussion, I want to address the other two, one of them more historical, the other more systematic, because I think they contain some elements necessary to understand the whole project of process theology. So that's my second point, heterogeneous practices. 
we come to think today that Prasa theology is a philosophical theology that is a philosophy that besides an investigation of the integrative wholeness of being is concerned with an interpretation of this universal whole in theistic terms. And this is true. However, it is only half of the truth. When we ask where and when Prasa theology originated, we find ourselves with Whitehead in Harvard's philosophy department, with Hartshorn in Chicago's philosophy department, and before and between all that, we might like to stop at the Divinity School of Chicago. In the midst of its development out of the social gospel movement, Shiloh Matthews, the school's dean discovered the Lowell Lectures Whitehead gave at Boston King's Chapel and published as Religion in the Making in 1926. He invited Henry Wyman, who lived in Chicago at that time, to interpret this text to the faculty. It was this reaction when the categories of Whitehead's thought settled in the Chicagoan theology that process theology was born as a gift of categories that underlined and influenced the social and liberation-oriented practices of the local theology. From then on, and right from the beginning, we find Prasa theology developing a body of thought and practices of diverse interests and directions. From then on, Prasa theology had both an empirical and a rationalist arm related to the work and the followers of Wyman and Hartshorn. But from this time on, the late 30s of the 20th century, process theology was as much a creation of Christian theology as it was a philosophical theology, as much of political theology as of metaphysics, of biblical intent to understand the Christian origin of God language as of the intellectual endeavor to transform in the to transform theology in the light of the disembodiment from the scientific world and the decline of its relevance as liberating power in society. Process theology, it seems, is always and always was in process. Out of heterogeneous practices, it engages into dif diverse discourses with only one in common, they point to a field of new experiences, understandings, and practices out of and in the consciousness of the relation of everything to everything as the flux of an indispensable multi-relatedness, or as Martin Luther King called it, the, ir the inescapable network of mutuality, the faults of salvation. This leads us to a second, the more systematic ascription of associations to process theology in short terms. Process theology discovers that in the relation of everything to everything, theology is just the other side of the mirror of this cosmology. In other words, God language remains a vital moment of the understanding of the universe as long as the infinite interrelatedness points to an identity that is a mystery, the mystery, at the depth of existence. Now, existere is, you may know, a term of Richard of St. Victor, meaning coming to be out of relations of everything. In order to understand this relation of cosmology and theology better, I will invoke an interpretation given by Bernard Loomer, the great follower of Wyman, also dean of the Chicago and Divinity School in the late 40s and fifth, early 50s of the 20th century. Prasi theology rests, he says, on three assumptions, all of them designed to overcome bifurcations that virtually were able to annul God's talk. First assumption, the ultimacy of becoming. Everything is nothing except in and as experience of everything else. Everything is the process of coping with its givenness by others. In the deepest sense, he says, you are what you eat. Physical food, conceptual food, spiritual food. We are out of others. We are the body of the appropriation of everything at a certain place within an open and movable whole. Second assumption, causal relationships. 
Nothing is real or, for that matter, ideal, except as being part of a vast movement of influences out of which it is created and that it creates. Our own self, seemingly a stronghold of our seamless identity, is formed, shaped and derived by others. We are our experiences, which in turn never are our possessions, but what, consti con but what, but what constitutes us before and beyond any control of unconscious ego or a substantial soul. Our self is social in nature and truly only given as in process. And the third assumption, becoming is always value-laden and thereby controversial. It is always the movement of competing interests, an ever-open process of qualification and re-evaluation, the ever-new achievement of worth. This makes the world problematic. In a world that is itself unfinished, problematic and open-ended, Lumos states, we experience a universe of novelty, adventure, risk and uncertainty. Every aspect of this world is in the making, without exception, including, therefore, God. The implication of these three assumptions now that Voluma creates process theology in the first place is primarily that God in such a world has no being apart from the world. Another quote from Loomer. There is no energy of God, no life of God, apart from the being, the energy, the life of the world. God, in this sense, is a relational, processive reality that is dependent upon the creatures, just as are they dependent upon God. Moreover, this means that God, in this process, web of interrelations, is precisely that reality, or better, that process, that saves its fragility. Not by controlling the whole process, but rather by both experiences, the heterogeneity and relentlessly offering potentials for us to reconsider, to struggle for, and to create the future as hope for ever rich concreteness. In its strive to understand and realize this hope, Passive Theology became a wealth of different endeavors, adventures, and practices. Different poetries of this becoming and relational God often not compatible with one another, but all of which are folds of a poetry of salvation that Whitehead, in a certain point in uh, process and reality, called the vision of the poet of the world. Divine poetry. Since the remaining considerations will center around this grand metaphor of Whitehead's, we may want to listen to the respective passage Whitehead writes, and it's on your paper. God's role in the processes in the world's creative process is not to co is not the combat of productive force with productive force of destructive force with destructive force it lies in the patient operation of the overpowering rationality of God's conceptual harmonization God does not create the world God saves it or more accurately God is the poet of the world with tender patience, leading it by God's vision of truth, beauty, and goodness. This God of infinite patience, Whitehead goes on, tenderly saves the turmoil of the world by the completion of God's own nature. Now to explain this metaphor for a moment, con let us consider three of its faults. Firstly, the term poet is, as Whitehead explained in a conversation with A.A. Johnson, not in the first place referring to a writer, a writer of poems, but to the Greek term for creator. In Aristotle's differentiation of practices of knowledge, it is the third form, neither theoria, knowing by meditation nor praxis, knowing by doing, but poetics, knowing by creating. Although it was reasoned such a divine poet would be nothing but a restatement of Plato's demiurge, the crafts god that takes the clay of existence to inform it with ideas. This interpretation would miss the important nuance of meaning Whitehead attached to it, namely that the poet does not 
combat, productive force with productive force, as would be true for the crafts god who by forming the clay imposes forms on formless matter. The divine poetry is of a very different character. It is an, as Whitehead says, overpowering rationality of conceptual harmonization, meaning a process that aims at the harmonization of possibilities that offer self-creation and ever new recreation. It is somehow the process that the Bible calls the wisdom of God. It is neither a creature, nor is it a transcendent God. Rather, it indicates the transforming power of interconnectedness, which in its highest manifestation often is called the good, the measureless well that lures towards value. Secondly, this poet stunningly does not create but rather saves the world in the midst of her physical turmoil. This differentiation, namely that a creator does not create but save, is due to Whitehead's rather strong conviction that no one controls the process of the processes of manifold and infinite interrelatedness that is the world. In the Christian context, what came to reign was a philosophy that heralded a timeless and changeless God of no empathy, who then was considered creator of a world of which he already knew its history a priori. Whitehead instead tried to recover the biblical God of empathy and solidarity, who is responsible rather than controlling, saving what is lost rather than creating what he knows will be lost. In insisting that every creature is self-creative and thereby is an end in itself, Whitehead dropped the metaphor of God as creator and adopted the metaphor of the tenderness of the all-saving poet. While the all-creative creator seems to be indicating unilateral omnipotence and hence seems to operate within the elusive paradigm of all-controlling uh, all power, the all-patient poet now symbolizes all-receptive, all-relational, all-sympathetic uh, and all-healing reconciliation. Thirdly, the poet in conducting the infinite process of harmonization realizes what Whitehead in Adventures of Ideas called peace. Because the poet's creative reconciliations are not part of this world of constructive and deconstructive forces, God realizes peace of harmonization with infinite patience, not by aiming at a final state. Peace, rather, is the very poetry itself, only present in the processes of the infinite realizations of harmonization. This poetry of God and the world is neither a beginning nor an end. Theology becomes poetry precisely when we take the absolutes out of the metaphor of God language. The poet in her process of harmonization guides by her vision towards infinite foldings, whereby the world is out of control and thereby beyond any control the infinite poem. counter discourses. After this glimpse into the undefined land of process theology's theopoetics, let me add instantly that not everyone is amused by this version of theology, to say the least. Often the perception of process theology's new God language seen from outside was that of a profound and even dangerous limitation of the notion of God and by the same token of the importance ascribed to it in the Christian theopolitical discourses. Consider, for instance, the following four indictments. While the doctrine of the Trinity is held to articulate the loving, communicating and relational God, process theology reduces it to the depolarity of God. while a classical doctrine of creation by the name of Creatio Ex Nihilo held infinite grace to be the origin of the creation out of God's benevolent will, God, uh, process theology reduces the creator to the demiurge who always presupposes a world. While Christology always aimed at the singular importance of Jesus Christ as the final revelation of God's redeeming love, 
process theology reduced the importance of Jesus from being the cause of salvation to contingently manifesting God's universal love, really present everywhere. And while Christian hope always aimed at the final coming of the kingdom of God, process theology reduced it to an infinite process of deferral tantamount with its non-realization. We could go on to add to this stream of reductionism with which process theology was and is indicted, but instead we could ask why this theopoetics of Whitehead and associated process theologies seems to so profoundly endanger Christianity. I shall answer that the reason is, and I consider it to be really the strength of process theology, that its theopoetics profoundly interrupts any theopolitics by radically transforming it into anthropopolitics and cosmopolitics. It is this theopoetic interruption that, as Whitehead noted, um, we are not longer accepting that the Galilean vision of humility is reversed in bestowing unto God the attributes which belonged exclusively to Caesar. Rather than being a reductionism on the side of process theology, the rejection of certain modes of God talk grows out of a theopoetics that uncovers a theopolitical implication of seemingly, or many theopolitical implications of seemingly innocent theological languages, codes, and doctrines. To be sure, that is to say that any God language is somehow caught up in an infinite network of political, social and bodily forces vastly guided by, uh, uh, by unconscious drives and superconscious prejudices. Hence it is, as with Bultmann's famous uh, I can't say that in English, it's Entmythologisierung in German, <laughs> demythologization, demythologization, say Entmythologisierung. The theopoetics of process theology is not a method of reductionism, but a field of reinterpretation, deconstruction and reconstruction, the shocking of the surface of seamlessness. Theopoetics, hence, is not only a descriptive term, but it has also a normative edge to it, namely that of a counter-discourse that opens up open-ended considerations within a space of infinitely becoming manifoldness, beyond any restriction brought into place by controlling power. With Foucault, this discourse is not only about issues, but about agendas that guide and hierarchies that direct the discourse. It is a theopoetic discourse precisely by its uncovering, discussing, interrupting and transforming of theopolitical interests and their hidden power presuppositions. In this counter-discourse, the depolarity of God raised the issue of patriarchalism and unilateralism in Trinitarian theologies. The creation out of chaos stripped the ex nihilo of the presupposition of controlling absoluteness. The confession of universal revelation and incarnation removed the Christological excuse for interreligious intolerance. And the ever-becoming kingdom of God freed the theological discourse of the apocalyptical anxieties that manipulates humanity in the face of a massa damnata. World loyalty. Process theology's theopoetics really acts in the face of the understanding that religion is dangerous. In Religion and the Making, Whitehead sensed that any undeconstructed theopolitics may be quite harmful and even evil, that the religion it helps to enforce may be indeed the last refuge of human savagery, which in Whitehead's eyes facilitates the horrors of, as he says, the slaughter of children, cannibalism, sensual orgies, abject superstition, hatred as between races, the maintenance of degrading customs, hysteria, and bigotry, all of them effects of religious fanatism. Religion for Whitehead is in its deepest sense not primarily a social and we may add a political 
fact, theopolitics tends to be herd psychology, a white said term, herd psychology. Religion, rather, is a connection of universality and solitariness. This is the disengagement from the immediate social routine, which is already subject to irrational theopolitical agendas of control, patriarchalism, sexism, racism and manipulation. Religion's rationality arises as space between scenes of solitariness and world consciousness. Quote, Prometheus chained to the rock, Muhammad brooding in the desert, the meditations of Buddha, the solitary man on the cross. It belongs to the depth of the religious spirit to have felt forsaken even by God. Religion in a theopoetic view appears only out of the exodus from immediacy and by the adventure of indefinite indefinite travel toward universality. When it discovers its world loyalty, when the multifarious world becomes home, when theopolitics transforms into anthropopolitics, when our God language redirects hope toward Earth. When we lose this world loyalty, religion becomes dangerous, when hope drags us towards absoluteness, absolute beginning and absolute end, the absolute good, absolute salvation. It becomes apocalyptic in dimension, totalitarian in the outlook, and rec recklessly revolutionary in action. The icon of the biblical deconstruction of this absolutism, which has manifested in totalitarian systems promoting the destruction of our only common ground of existence, our earth, is as Whitehead saw clearly to be found in the book Job. Job, quote Whitehead, is tearing to pieces the sophism that all is for the best in the best of possible worlds and that the justice of God is beautiful evi beautifully evident in everything that happens. Job's own revolution against the solution of uh, apocalyptic totalitarianism ends in a new world loyalty. The only justification of God language in Job 38 relies on the meditation on the infinite depth of creation itself. It is in its best theopoetic articulation, creation, it says in Job, bursts out of a womb. That is not God the Father. Rather, Job knows, knows of God who is the way to the dwelling of light and the place of darkness. He praises a God who walked in the recesses of the deep. When we follow this path of infinite depth, the overpowering rationality of the poet of the world is the ever-becoming harmonization of infinite variations that generates irreducible manifoldness of values, the infinite folding unfolding, refolding of multiplicity. Gilles Deleuze, the French post-structuralist, called Whitehead's world loyalty, in which God and world coincide, the chaosmos, chaosmos, chaos and cosmos together, the chaosmos wherein even God, quote, becomes process, a process that at once affirms incompossibilities and passes through them. It is this interruption of theopolitics of the one by which the theo, uh, theopoetry of the chaos aligns with other theologies that recognize the break with theopolitical languages of power, with Bonhoeffer's non-religious pro-existing God, Hans Jonas' suffering God after Auschwitz, Altheiser's self-annihilating God, Johnny Vatimo's weak categories of a god of kenesis or Ruther's ecofeminist div divine metrics. It was for these same reasons that Henry Wyman insisted that we could have, that we would have to choose either a god of power or a god of goodness. In its most radical form, this theopoetics may have been revealed in a statement from Bernard Loomer in his manuscript, The Size of God, I quote, the world is God because it is the source 
and preserver of meaning because the creative advance of the world is its adventure in the supreme cause is the supreme cause to be served and because it contains and yet enshrouds the ultimate mystery inherent within existence itself god symbolizes this incredible mystery indeed in lumos poetry the counter discourse on power and goodness has reached a point where god language seems even to be on the verge of evanescence but it is precisely on the edge of this disappearance that theopoetics dwells it is precisely here as white says along the borders of chaos where we seem to lose the differences and the interstitial space space opens for the mystery of life and god symbolizes this mystery invisibility what happens when we follow this poetry of evanescence what disappears is not god not god language as such but rather a language of power and control that was attached to our theology in light of such deconstruction we realize that our inclination to always seek unity might disguise interests of control our desire to seek a safe base for rationality rather than to trust the abyss our desire to seek safe uh, our desire to seek safe security rather than truth indeed it is when we begin to mistrust the language of the one the self evident project to seek an entity at the base of all actual things that we begin or might begin to discover the poetry of the recesses of the deep in job's language what then reappears on the surface of chaos moss is uncontrolled plurality realizing this multipli multiplicity of the depth might be shocking at first glance sheer plurality is unsettling disturbing or we fear relativism anarchy irrelevance and indeed all this can happen when we dare to open the gates of the sea to that in the poetry of the book job so that it bursts out of the womb to be sure this is the price for the evanescence of the paradigm of control it is if you like the evil shadow but on the other hand the bright side the liberating effect of this theopoetic reappearance of the recesses of the deep is that we realize that their invisibility is a category of empirical control what reappears is the oppressed plurality of differences of otherness of diversity that is often so unbearable um, unbearable to our as white it says ape like ape like consciousness we are corrupted by this fear and we always at any time are ready to be corrupted by a theopolitical move that uses god language to manipulate the visibility of the unoppressed plurality of feelings cultures languages social organizations or life forms the theopoetic chaos most however is not mere anarchy it reveals multiplicity or many faultness it articulates infinite relatedness in becoming Luma at a certain point names it the web of life here plurality is not relationless particularization and responsiveness relativism but a relationality that is uncontrolled and uncontrollable by any unity consequently in this poetics of the visibility of multiplicity god no longer signifies an entity but rather is in lumos theopoetic language conceived as a network of interrelated individuals again in the theopoetic reformulation of the visibility of unoppressed multiplicity we have not lost unity but rather concepts of unity that distract theopoetics from its world loyalty in order to reinstall theopoet theopolitical moves of power and manipulation in the evanescence of the language of the one theopoetics grants unity the invisibility it has always had in biblical god language god is invisible no mortal can see god and live 
Not even Moses could see more than the passing God from the back, the dark side. Quote, And while my glory passes by, I will cover you with my hand until my glory has passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And in Romans, Paul address, addresses the eternal power and divine nature of God to be invisible. Against all idolatry, the language of the invisibility of the one at the same time articulates the grace of the visibility of unoppressed manifoldness. Its theopolitical consequence is stated in Jesus' first appearance in the synagogue in Luke 4, where he read Isaiah and proclaimed the visibility of the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. It is the same invisibility of the divine in the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the prisoner in Matthew 25 that saves their dignity. The revolt against dualism. Theopoetics radically articulates these infinite foldings of becoming for which God symbolizes the mystery of its dignity. This poet is the insistence on the walking in the recesses of the infinite chaosmos. The true adversary to this poetics of multiplicity is the abstraction from its uncontrolled concreteness. Where abstractions save as instruments of oppression of the multiple folds of the visibility, visibility of becoming. Now, although these abstractions might end up with oppressive forms of monism, monologism, monopolism, monadism, monolateralism, or certain forms of monotheism, all of these reductionisms rather are forms of dualism. Stated differently, the theopolitics of the oppressive visibility of the one is created by a process of abstraction that Whitehead has called the fallacy of misplayed concreteness, and its basis, basic feature is dualism, the exchange of concreteness for abstractions in absolute opposition. Here we are right at the center of Whitehead's metaphysical approach, especially in process and reality. It is based on the conviction that the concreteness of becoming can never be restated in any set of abstractions because it is self-creative and in this sense cannot be derived from anything as this unique becoming. In science and the modern world, therefore, White had introduced the principle of concretion which he named God to insist on the manifoldness of becoming over against any attempt to abstractly reconstruct it. Its knowledge necessarily must be collected empirically. Hence the principle of concretion manifests the final, as Whitehead says, irrationality in the fabric of interrelations. It speaks of the mystery of difference, of uniqueness, and of the graciousness of, con of connectivity. Concreteness is misplaced when we take the abstractions that we use to understand manifoldness to be the real reality beyond appearances, which by the same token are then reduced to mere appearances. If we understand abstractions not as instruments of mental simplification of faults of becoming, but emphasize them instead of the multiple becomings, we begin to misuse them as instruments of power. It is here that the imperialistic seductions begin to corrupt our perception. It is here that we become vulnerable to theopolitical power plays, often without realizing them. The colonizing effect of this misuse of abstractions is most powerful when they form mutually exclusive categories. We all know of these dualisms and how their clash produced myriads of philosophical, theological, political and humanitarian struggles. Mind and matter, soul and body, good and the evil light and darkness, the saved and the damned, the left and the right, and yes, God and the world. How easy these categories are used and how often they are used with utmost cruelty to create an empirical space ex nihilo for one's own theopolitics. 
Either you are on the side of the sons of light, or you will end up in darkness. Either you are on the right side, or you will be marginalized. marginalized. Either you are a true believer, or you are part of the Massa Danata. Either you, are, you have a soul, or you may rot like an animal. Either you choose the right God for your soul, or you are under the reign of the God of this world. In this dualism, the colonizing one not only led to apocalyptic activism based on aggressively exclusive truth claims, in practice it fuels the fires of xenophobia, sexism, political and social oppression, of fanatism, terrorism and genocide, and of any kind of justification of the rightness for the extinction of the other. It is against this dualism, then, that Whitehead in Adventures of Ideas speaks of his philosophical program as revolt against dualism, wherever a vicious dualism appears. Here he is in line with, and although decades earlier, then philosophies of difference like Levinas, Derrida, or Deleuze. Transpantheism. When the one becomes invisible again, this is really not about the loss of monism, but of dualism. The disappearance of dualism, of that abstract categories opposed to one another, the disappearance of this dualism is really a condition for the liberation of multiplicity. Gilles Deleuze used the formula that as soon as dualism vanishes, monism is pluralism. The same strategy, I think, appears in Lumos' theopoetic language when he says that God is the world or the network of interrelatedness itself. This is not flat pantheism, but liberation of manifoldness. Some would call this position panentheism. But I'm reluctant to do so because the word panentheism makes a unity uh, names a unity in which all is one. This language that focuses on unity again tends to be at least in danger to harbor again the dualism it was supposed to extradite. To the extent that unity becomes visible, dualism has the inclination to get hold again of the theopoetic resistance. We might rather call it transpantheism namely the disappearance of the visibility of the one. For Whitehead, however, this revolt against dualism must be counterbalanced with a certain defense of dualism, as he says, in a sense that there is no final exclusion of any object concept. The evanescence of dualistic God language in, in the evanescence of dualistic God language, we have to be aware of the remaining, as he says, dualism in the concept between unity and multiplicity. Whitehead therefore includes all these dualisms within each occasion of actuality, another quote, that is in the infinite manifoldness of becoming itself. What else does this mean? That the evanescence of dualism must not leave us with a new static dualism between monism and pluralism, but that dualisms must disappear as a process of multiplicity. The most dense formulation of this counter-dualistic discourse is to be found in the heart of the, his uh, Whitehead's category scheme in process and reality, namely the category of the ultimate. In this category, Whitehead relates the one and the many by the creative process of the unification that at the same time is multiplication. It is, with Derrida, a process of difference. Here, I think, we are also at the heart of Whitehead's theopoetics, in which he identifies his ultimate triad of one, many, and creativity with the movement of God and the world, the contrasted opposites, in, which term, in terms of which creativity achieves its supreme task. In which God is as much unity as God is multiplicity. In which God creates the world as the world creates God. Now, the, theopolit, theo, the theological poetry becomes an expression of the process of becoming multiplicity itself. It issues 
a theology of the fault. A theology of the fault. Dorothy Sölle once said in an article on Charles Hartshorn that every good theological statement is a decision that excludes something. And indeed, as we have seen, the theopoetics of process theology excludes any language of power and control. However, when theopoetics wants to create a language space for the visibility of multiplicity of becoming, it must not by any means reinstall a hidden dualism, thereby falling into misplaced concreteness. This is the true decision and exclusion. Therefore, we must be very cautious to draw a line of absolute exclusion. Rather, as we have seen earlier, absolute dualism must be sought within the process of manifoldness. And we are talking about important opposites here, which we must learn to understand as abstractions in process, such as power and goodness, becoming and being, absoluteness and relativity, the polarity and trinity, creation ex nihilo and creation out of chaos, the uniqueness of Christ and the universality of salvation, the hope for the end of evil and the infinite process of creation, the poet who saves and the creator who initiates. Here, the principle of exclusion we seek that divides process theology from any language of power and control or theopoetics from theopolitics will look more like what Catherine Keller has called a theological principle of uncertainty. It will not force us into a certainty of dualism. Rather, we must learn to explore an infirm and somehow blurred landscape of multiplicity. We must learn to value the infinite faults of becoming. We must begin to formulate a theology of the fault, of many faultness, of multiplication, implication and explication. Plica, explica, faults out of faults indefinitely. In seeking a principle of uncertainty in this ever-folding becoming that avoids the reintroduction of dualistic abstractions, I find it in the very structure of Whitehead's theopoetic triad of God, world, and creativity. Rather than to present us abstractions of absolute opposites, like unity, multiplicity, God, world, it introduces a third element, namely creativity. In the post-colonial language of Homi Barber, this third element functions as a third space, an interstitial space, space. It is not substantial, it is empty. It is not one, it is different. It is the creative space of difference, of faults out of faults. It is the space in which the one is invisible so as to allow us to talk, to walk in the recesses of the deep. It resonates with Plato's Cora, the empty space that in Whitehead's Adventures of Ideas appears as receptacle, as empty space of what he says, mutual immanence and medium of intercommunication. It is the space of manifoldness of becoming. In other words, this creative space is nothing for itself. It is pure emptiness in the light of the becoming multiplicity of the creative generation of the faults because it names the invisibility of the one, it generates an unabridged and unoppressed multiplicity of becoming. It is because of the insistence on this third element that the process does not fall apart into dualisms again, that of the one, that of the many, of God and the world. Indeed, it is this same insistence of the empty space on manifoldness that allows us to transcend the absolute dualism of power and goodness, becoming and being, the polarity and trinity, and so on. Instead of freezing the picture into final antagonisms, the theopoetic space unfolds an infinite spectrum of implicit implicit shades of relations, ever blurring these abstractions. In following Solis' demand, I think the principle of uncertainty of this theology of the fold that walks in the recesses of the third space can be understood as follows, and you have got that sentence on your paper. Every theopoetic statement 
that avoids theopolitical suppression of the visibility of manifoldness must be a statement that always can be formulated in modes of both difference and non-difference. Now let me explain this with Loomer. Loomer's proposition that God is the world verbalizes a non-difference between God and the world since on the other hand it does also insist on a certain difference between God and the world. It is not the expression of a, of a plain pantheistic identity of God and the world. However, since it does not state merely the dualistic difference between God and the world, it must contain a moment of non-difference. A moment whereby the duality of God and the world remains in the process of mutual, trans mutual immanence. Therefore, it is a good theopoetic statement because it states a difference and a non-difference at the same time. The consequences are far-reaching, although this seems to be very theoretical. A theopoetic statement will undercut the dualistic play of power when and as long as it generates metaphors of faults on a continuum, or if you like a discontinuum, of infinite multiplicity. As long as the plane of multiplicity is not left and absolute opposites are avoided, therefore many theopoetic languages are possible and may in their context be appropriate. There may be, for instance, a legitimate poetry of Trinity within process theology as well as a legitimate language of depolarity. Or we may imagine a legitimate theopoetic concern for creation that allows for a certain kind of ex nihilo as well as for the chaos. All this might be possible, legitimate and even welcomed by a theology of the fold as long as multiplicity remains visible. Then indeed theopoetics is not an instrument of reduction but of interpretation, not of antagonism but of multiplication. Theopoetics of multiplicity. For an ending, and this is only one of many possible on a scale, let me come back to the in, uh, initial metaphor of the poetry and my personal history with it. While I realized the principle of difference and non-difference in my first book on process theology published in 2000 in Germany, which really laid the basis for that kind of process theology of the fold, it was not before my second book on process theology, the, God, the poet of the world, Gott als Poet der Welt, in German, three years later that I began to use the concept of theopoetics for a theology of manifoldness. Underlying, underlying this whole process was, in fact, from the beginning, one of the most important witnesses as far back as the Renaissance I could identify for such a theopoetics of multiplicity. Nicholas of Cusa. In his theology of the non-aliot, which means non-other, the non-other was a category indicating a divine reality which is neither the same nor the other, neither found by identification nor by ways of opposition. Its in-betweenness allowed me to find a common ground of so radically different process approaches such as Bernard Loomer's, which is seemingly pantheistic, and for instance Marjorie Suchokic's, which is more interested in the Christian differentiation between God and the world. Both of them and many other approaches in between suddenly fell on a common continuum of possible realizations of the principle of uncertainty or the principle of difference and non-difference. It showed an infinite scale of manifold manifestations of theopolitic languages. Nicholas of Cusa developed his theology of the fold by understanding the world as explicatio, explication, explicatio, of that what is implicated in God's nature. And vice versa, he interpreted God to be the implicatio of what is ex uh, explicated in the world. The whole relationship between God and the world was therefore captured in a metaphor of the fold. Or as he says, God and the world relate in mutual complicatio, meaning that they concurse in such a complication that never can be reduced to simplicity, oneness or unity, but rather 
this is the third space as Whitehead's creativity. Indeed, in this theology, unity became already invisible and multiplicity became visible. From the cardinal of the Roman Church, this idea took its root through the burnt heretic Giordano Bruno and ended up with Gilles Deleuze's philosophy of infinite immanence. And he used the term or the, or the metaphor of the fold then prominently for his book on Leibniz, in the middle of which all of the sudden Whitehead appears. We may indeed find Whitehead on the ground of a fragile tradition that goes back to the Renaissance and ch uh, chances are good to trace it even further back. In its current incarnation, it allies with the French philosophy of difference Deleuze helped to initiate. When I came to Claremont for the Whitehead conference in 1998, for the presentation of some of these ideas, I thought I would be the only one to draw these connections between Cusa, Whitehead and Deleuze. But astonishingly, I found someone else working in this area, Kathleen Keller. And ever since, our thoughts crossed in a common sea of difference. Her work on the theology of becoming has helped tremendously to develop a current Whiteheadian, Deleuzean theology of the fault. If there is any prospect for the future of process theology as theopoetics, I think it will be on the lines of a deeper understanding of this poetry in process thought, theologically, by insisting on visible manifoldness, and politically, by deconstructing any unifying claim in the light of the living multiplicity of becoming. In this sense, a theology of the fold may be important for a poetics and a politics of unoppressed diversity. Gardener making. In my own thought, this has led to the understanding of the poet, Greek for the maker, as God in the making. Like Whitehead's use for the book Religion in the Making, this phrase indicates becoming, but becoming with a twist. Not the poem is created, but the poet. Not the creation becomes, but the creator. We literally create the becoming of the poet, who in turn saves us with tender patience. Indeed, the poet, as poet, saves our manifoldness. The unity or harmonization of the poem is invisible and to this extent visualizes the folds, ripples, recesses of the deep of becoming. Theopoetically, we may like to always seek the manifolds, the cracks and abysses in the surface. This poetry is always in love with manifoldness. The only security the divine poetry grants us is God's love for our diversity, including the poetic diversity of our pilgrimage with God. The uniqueness of our experiences may be what God wants us to explore, seek, find, communicate, adventurously pursue. God is in the making by insisting on our poetry, by saving our ways with the poet in all manifoldness into the immediacy of the great poem. So let me end with three confessions for uh, theopoetics of multiplicity. Walt Whitman, in the song of myself in Leaves of Grass, has it as a revelation. Bernard Loomer, later in his life, when he developed the metaphor of the size and stature of God, has referred to it. He realizes, I am large, I contain multitudes. Gilles Deleuze, in his famous introduction to his opus A Thousand Plateaus, entitled Rhythm, has it as a program. He urges, be neither one nor a many, be multiplicities. But the Los Angeles Public Library in downtown Los Angeles has it engraved in stone in Greek letters. It reads, polyphilia, the love for manifoldness. Thank you.